Greetings all. Welcome to another session here at Tuesday Talks. Today we're going to be looking at sociolinguistic perspectives, the study of language in use. We'll be looking at how some of the research in the field of second language acquisition with particular emphasis on the sociolinguistics aspects and how group dynamics uh, and other elements have helped or hindered the research that's going on in these areas. In particular, we'll be uh, doing a little review of the variability in second language use, the uh, second language socialization, the communities of practice, practice uh, second language learning and identity, and how different identities may e emerge. Also, the impact of affect and the impact of investment on second language learning. And then we'll talk a little bit about the evaluation of the research to date, its scope, and its impact. Let's begin by looking into the variability in second language uh, use. Uh, now, people are using the second language as they're learning it. They're going to be using it differently depending on a number of factors. So, for example, depending on their age or depending on their language level. Also, the interaction of their interlanguage. Um, so, what are the causes for some of these you know, different levels of usage? Some of it can be internal. Uh, it can be something called marketness, for example. How marked is this new thing? And, and I'm certain you've seen, you've talked about marketness before. The more different a new uh, piece of grammar or a new piece of uh, phraseology is from the first language, the more it's going to be marked. Uh, the more offset it is, whether it's a word or it's a phrase or it's a, even a sound can be marked. And when they talk about marketness, they mean they're saying that it's more, uh, it's different enough to cause a problem. And uh, so something may be marked, it may be easy to learn, but because it doesn't exist in the first language or because it doesn't uh, appear uh, in that usage form, in that form in the first language, it's going to be more difficult. It's marked as something that's more difficult to acquire. It could be markedness. It could be the fact that language changes over time. Um, so that the language that one used at one point is not going to be the same as it's being used later on. It could be a universal development constraint. It could be something that's going on in the interlanguage, um, that the language that they're learning God that's going on in here, they keep it for some reason. They don't begin to notice a difference. Uh, and so the, the just the development of the inner language as it's progressing, as they're learning language, is going to produce variability in second language use. Uh, the evolution of uh, the inner language, interestingly enough, appears to, pig uh, to mirror uh, pigeon. And pigeon, uh, as you know, is an amalgamation of two or three languages coming together, and it's created <laughs> in such a way that uh, you know it's not completely one or the other, but it's kind of this hodgepodge as people are beginning to learn and understand how to interact with languages. Pigeon also can also emerge into a new language. And that's really not what they're saying here, but they're saying as the inner language develops, that development process is kind of similar to how a, a pigeon emerges. All this to say, while it's developing, it's providing variability in the use of second language. So it could be this universal development and the constraints therein with the inner language. It could also be L1 transfer that is creating uh, differences in the use of language. This variability simply could be you're stealing from the L1 in order to use it in the L2. Those are internal reasons. External reasons could simply be style. Uh, you're preferring to use this language over that language. You're preferring to say that uh, you know something is uh, aqua instead of blue. You know, you're just a style. It could be a gender thing that um, <laughs> uh, Women use language in a particular way, men use language in a particular way, and so it may just be a gender thing. It may be that there's a need for variety, um, depending on the situation. You find yourself in a different situation, you're in a different register that you need in order to function uh, in that different element. So it could be something that's actual that you need. It could be gender. Uh, and it could be uh, just personal style. Those are external factors, reasons for this variability in the use of a uh, second language. Uh, some have tried to quantify this whole idea of variability um, with varying degrees of success. 
uh, wanting to see and, uh, and list and categorize the different types that there are. Now, in other languages, there are more registers, there are more communities of language, and so you see more distinct patterns that could be developed and, and, uh, and categorized. Uh, in English, uh, you do have those variabilities, some that are used properly, some that are used improperly, especially for second language learners. Um, but all that said and done, there are some who are trying to go out there and quantify this variability. There's also variations within the inner language, as I've already talked to you about. And uh, there exists, obviously, within the language, a variety of different formats that you can use to have this uh, variability. You can use the vernacular. Uh, you can use a mixed language, or you can use formal language. Uh, and they are all important. They all play a role. They all have limited uh, opportunities. Um, I can think of several examples within uh, newsprint or within movies where people begin by using normal, proper speech, and then they jump into vernacular on, uh, on purpose. Um, in order to make a point, whether that point is to speak to the people or whether that point is to make someone look bad. Um, but you see that each one of these has a role. Um, this also says to me, and this is putting it aside here, you who are language users, whether you're second language users or not, the language you use can mark you, can Dis distinguish you as a particular person in a particular group. So be careful. Notice how you pronounce things. Notice what words you use when you're trying to communicate with somebody. If you do not, you could get yourself in trouble by employing words that ain't right, by using words that do not fit the, uh, the uh, current situation, current environment and it could get you in trouble, or it could, if you're, if you're with it, if you're observing, if you're noticing what's going on, it would be to your advantage. Uh, just had an example the other day where I was writing to someone and I was saying, you know, dear Dr. So-and-so, I want to thank you for yada, 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 you know, and I signed my name to the end of this email. Well, that person sends me back an email that says, hi, Frank, my first name. Now, they're they're, I'm trying to say that they were above me as far as rank or register, but they lowered themselves to come to me and say, hey, okay, we can be at the same level. Uh, you want to notice that okay, in your, in your dealings with people when you use language, whether it's first or second. Um, all of them have a role, but uh, they are limited in their role and in their structure. So that's variability in language use. We also want to look at second language socialization. In other words, how do we take... Uh, someone who's learning this second language, how do we get them into the group or the society that uses the language that they want to enter? Bear in mind, when you start using a language, you're, you're not part of the group. You're not part of the in crowd. Okay, You have to join that group and you need to show that you can uh, uh, stand up in that group and make your voice heard and defend your ideas and, and you know interact appropriately. You don't get that just because you know language. You also have to be able to do that. So these studies on socialization where a newcomer to the language, a newcomer to the group is trying to assert themselves into the group. Um, and how does that work? And what happens during the process? And how can we as teachers um, aid this? Uh, these studies are rooted in anthropological linguistics where we're studying the language and the people at the same time and those types of interactions. Uh, believe that language and culture are inexplicably intertwined. I've said this before, and obviously I'll say it again, that you can't really study one without the other. You can't study language without culture and vice versa. They are connected, and so when you're learning language, when you're teaching language, when you're acquiring language, you also have to acquire the culture in which that language exists. Thus, we need to join a group. We need to be a part of a group in such a way that we can also use the language, interact with the language. Uh, very important, this whole idea of second language socialization. There are developmental links between the first language and culture. Um, that makes sense, right? Culture and language are kind of connected. The same thing's going to happen with second language. There are connections between second language and second culture. 
Now, obviously, we're bringing first language as well into, and first culture as well, into this new group. So we're bringing some other oddities to the second language uh, and second cultural environment, okay? Uh, second language studies of sociolinguistics. They oftentimes use ethnographic studies, ethnographic methods in order to examine what's going on. The people who are doing sociolinguistic uh, uh, studies have to study not only the language, but they have to study the language in use in a dynamic setting. Okay, They're not like the cognitivists who are trying to figure out what's going on in the brain. They're not taking out a segment of something or two or three sentences and trying to analyze that. No, they've got to be able to see it in progress. Um, so it's more of an ethnographic study. Makes sense considering the content that you're having to deal with. Um, so, and, and there are people who are out there who are doing studies to try to analyze this. Some of the studies are actually looking at a particular community and seeing how these newcomers uh, interact uh, within the group. And so these were, were called communities of practice. So basically, you've got somebody who's not only learned language, but now they need to join a science class or they need to join uh, you know, a subgroup in a business in order to, to perform some type of activity or task. Okay, this is a little community of practice. Situated second language learning because it's a situation that they have to be involved in. Second language learners need to be able to appropriately participate in a variety of speaking activities. So if you have students who are coming in trying to learn a second language, you also need to recognize they're going to be in a class. They're going to have to go to science class or history class or uh, art class and they've got to interact there. So you want to be able to help them interact okay I make themselves part of that group uh, while they're learning language so they need to have control over the group language okay just some quick examples how to ask a question how to ask for help how to interact how to take control of a conversation right they need to know how to do all of this in addition to just learning language that group dynamic that they're gonna have to know they're going to have to somehow begin as an outsider and, be, and bring themselves into the group. And how do you do that? How do they become a core member? Um, any of you who've transferred to a new school, uh, you know, you're in, you're in the middle of sixth grade or you're in the middle of eighth grade and you transfer to a new school. It's a whole new environment now that you're in. You're that outsider. And how do you move into the inner circles uh, that are at a school? Okay, it's the same type of thing here, except it's not just a new location with the same basic culture and language. No, this is a brand new culture, brand new language. So how do they do that? How do they move in to that inner circle? And then the other question is, how do you as a teacher help them get into that inner circle? And there are people who are studying this type of uh, activities and studying, doing a study with regard to language. Uh, they're doing this type of research. It's quite interesting the things that are going on there because uh, it's going to help students, it's going to help children, it's going to help adults more quickly appropriate into the new culture, the new environment, the new community that they're going to be involved in. Research indicates that children become group members faster than adults. Um, why this is? I would think there are going to be a number of affective reasons why that's going to be. Uh, but they are seeing that. They're also seeing that um, having the opportunity to interact in the group is going to play a crucial role. So you as adults, you as students or whatever, you need to create opportunities for these students to interact in those, in those group settings. It may also be that you create some mock-ups, some practice group settings so that they can practice with what's going on before they get into the actual one. So maybe, just for example, you're teaching kids how to interact in a science class or interact in a history class, uh, interact in a, in a club. And you create a mock club in your classroom so they can practice with this interaction. Maybe you pull in people, right? Uh, maybe you pull in people from another class in order to help them practice with that so they can practice right they got the they got the scaffolding they got the modeling now you're gonna actually have them practice in a, in a real life session uh, and before they go off and they go do that so opportunities to interact with the target group is very important having a friend in the group makes the acceptance easier right and I look at that and I'm thinking well oh, that makes so much sense right somebody invites somebody else in and now they're gonna become more accepted more quickly uh, they're also gonna probably get better assistance okay 
You as a language learner, you should be thinking about that. If I want to get into this group, I should make a friend with someone. They're going to help me in. Um, if you're a teacher, you should be thinking, okay, this is a newcomer who's coming in, and that would be good for them. Bring them in by trying to find a friend for them. Or you be that friend, right, to give that assistance, right? In addition to uh, the ideas of uh, having a friend and practice, the issues of power and authority are also going to influence second language learning opportunities. Um, always uh, want to be cognizant of the power that a teacher has, the authority that a teacher has, and not to abuse it, but to use it to the advantage to help your students acquire language. Again, you don't want to force anything on them. Um, you want to be able to use it for their benefit, not for you know your benefit or for some other ulterior motive. Um, at the same time, you want the people who are the group, right, uh, the, the native speaker group, not to abuse this newcomer as they're coming in. So you want to keep an eye on that area as well. In any event, power and authority are going to influence second language learner um, opportunities. Try to make sure that they the impact are good and not bad. Second language learning also is going to be impacted by cultural identity, right? And some people are actually have their identity reconstructed. They get a separate identity. And I have met people um, who, you know, they learn a second language, they learn a second culture, and the culture is so very different that they actually have a very different personality in the second culture. Um, I have met, in particular, Japanese students who were quiet in their culture, but when they came to the English culture, they became very outgoing and outspoken. Uh, so these two different identities, and, and literally people did not recognize one from the other, uh, depending on the culture that they were in. There are, there are others that are the same on both sides, but it's going to depend on a number of factors. In any event, social identity and second language learning is real, and you might have a different identity. Your identity may be different because of the your age, because of your ability, because of your motivations, right? It may be the difference because of a culture something you're pulling in from the old culture. Um, it, it may be that you want it in the old culture, but they wouldn't allow it, and the new culture will, so you're, you're more free to do that. It may be, and again, all of those positions, all of those things. It may be the position of the second language learner. Uh, it may be that in the first culture you were uh, very formal because you were the boss, but in the second language culture you're not the boss. You're just a student in the class, and nobody knows that you were the boss, so you get to play more. You get to be more free and open type of thing. So it may depend on your rank in that second culture. It may depend on your language uh, ability, your age, and your motivation, any number of things that can be involved in changing your social identity. For those of you who are only know one language, I would love for you to learn a second language and try to be different. Um, you may also have no choice, obviously, and that's the real purpose of this particular section, is that people have a second identity, a second culture. They may, you know, that may be something that's kind of pushed onto them because of the position that they're in. Um, and this would be, for example, someone who is uh, uh, less formal in one situation, but they get a job in a, in, a, in a company, and they have to run, be the leader of the company in another culture, and the other culture is more formal, plus they have a higher position, and so now they have to be more formal and more proper, and they can't be as laid back and as and relaxed as they were in their old culture when they were lower on the totem pole, right? So be forced into it. But then there are times where you can just choose, right? So uh, it may involve stages of loss and gain, and what... Uh, uh, Pavlenko is talking about here is loss and gain with regard to uh, interaction ability, uh, you know, loss and gain with regard to formality, and even loss and gain within the idea of uh, freedom within a within culture, uh, things that you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. So uh, interesting, this whole concept of uh, identity when we're talking about uh, social linguistics and socialization with second language learning. Uh, lastly, I want to talk a little bit about affect and investment. Um, these ideas are going to impact the socialization capabilities. One element of affect is going to be motivation. How motivated are you? What kind of motivation is it? Is it internal, external, instrumental, and integrative? Regardless of what it is, motivation may impact your affective filter, your affect. Uh, and that is going to have some sort of impact on your second language learning. 
there may be pressures or feelings there may be some tragedy or some event you know good or bad that's going to impact things your attitudes about language your attitude about the second culture right maybe you're being here because you're forced to learn language okay and so uh, that's going to be an issue could be identity issues where you don't want to acquire a new identity uh, all can impact your uh, second language learning abilities all can impact how you become part of this group okay so there are a lot of re uh, variables that can impact how well you interact in this new culture in this new society in these new communities another thing that's going to impact it is your investment how involved invested are you in learning this new language you know there's the story of uh, i believe it was cortez when he uh, arrived on the beaches uh, in South uh, South America, and he burned his Brit he burned his uh, boats uh, so that nobody could run away. That they would be completely invested in what the endeavor was that they were going to do. Uh, people who are like that, they're invested like that in language learning. They're the easy ones to teach because they know they want to learn this. They know they're going to be involved in this second language, and so they're invested. You have many people who are not so invested. You've got students who are simply sitting in a class because they have to sit in the class. They're minimally invested. Good idea for you, find a way to get them invested. Find a way to say to them, this is something I want. Uh, some have said, hey, let them be invested in the construction of the curriculum. Now it's their goals that's involved, and now they're going to be more invested, so they're going to be more motivated. All this to say investment in the language is going to impact how quickly they socialize into this new culture. Um, those that are, are have a greater investment are going to have a greater involvement, greater uh, success in becoming socialized into the groups using, uh, using language. Affect investment. Some evaluations on the scope and impact of uh, the research today in this whole idea of sociolinguistics and socialization in um, in second language learning the studies continue some are some things are interesting that are being studied and we've just covered some of them most of the research that's being done are in the form of case studies or ethnographies um, so that's going to require more time where you're actually involved in the uh, in the culture and analyzing the culture there's a lot more data that you have to filter through because you're doing a case study or an ethnography um, some groups are investigating the impact of sociolinguistics on interlanguage and how it's impacting how that learning process in the interlanguage uh, some of these things are describing how things like identity or the communities of practice or power influences are impacting what's going on again we've talked about some of those before and that's all I have right now with regard to these sociolinguistic perspectives and how uh, the environment that you're in, the socio environments that you're in are going to be impacting uh, your language use. I do thank you for stopping by. And if you do have any questions, please drop me a note. Talk to you later.